Welcome back for our second session of our Engineering to Build Back Better conference. Uh, while we allow everybody to get settled in, uh, we've got another quick poll for you uh, to get you thinking about the theme for this afternoon. Uh, so this question uh, this time around for you is, uh, which profession do you think has the most relevant skills and expertise for understanding and managing complex systems? Uh, option A is engineers. Uh, B is academic researchers in other disciplines, so for example, economics or social sciences. Uh, option C is policymakers, uh, or D is another profession. So uh, while you have a couple of minutes to think about the question and submit your answer, I will introduce our next session a little bit further. The COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the complexity and the interplay uh, between the systems that we live and work within. Uh, so that's from health to the economy uh, and climate change to social issues. As we look to build back better from the pandemic, uh, the systems, infrastructure and the technology that we build uh, must not just be sustainable, but it also needs to be resilient to uh, challenges. So that might be future health crises like the one that we've just been through, extreme climate events that we are seeing increasingly around the world or economic or social changes. So in this session, we will explore what a resilient and sustainable future looks like and how engineers can help to deliver this. Uh, we have three brilliant speakers who will open our session. Uh, we will then be joined by uh, an additional two panelists um, for what I'm sure is going to be quite a thought provoking discussion. Uh, so our speakers and panelists will explore this topic from different perspectives, uh, including the regulation of complex systems, uh, digital resilience and the role of research and innovation in contributing to a resilient society. All right. So before I introduce our first speaker, uh, let's have a look at the um, poll results. OK, so we've got um, not not very much variety in, in the answers there. Uh, so uh, whoever has participated thinks that engineers have the most relevant uh, skills and expertise. Um, I think we might be a slightly biased audience. Um, <laughs> that's my reflection on that. Um, but thank you very much for um, giving your opinions there. Uh, so let me introduce our first speaker. Um, the first speaker for this session is Professor Roger Kemp, Emeritus Professor at Lancaster University and Chair of the Advisory Board for the Academy's Safer Complex Systems Programme. Uh, over to you, Roger. Thank you very much. My first slide shows the branding Engineering X. Engineering X have the next slide, please. Engineering X was founded by the Royal Academy of Engineering and Lloyd's Register Foundation with the aim of building a network of global alliances to tackle some of the most pressing engineering, safety and sustainability problems and to develop practical, sustainable and accessible solutions for the engineering profession worldwide. Next slide, please. As I'm sure you know, and as we've been talking about earlier, the rapidly changing and increasingly complex nature of the world means that complex systems are increasingly uncertain and unpredictable. In early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic just shifted the frame of reference to all of us, demonstrating how the increasing complexity and interconnectedness of the world we live in has made us all more vulnerable to systemic shocks. A major global safety challenge, therefore, is to develop our understanding of the root causes of systemic failure and to take collective action to prevent or mitigate against future events with a similar potential to harm. Within the complex systems group at the um, Engineering X, we identified two broad classes of complex systems. On the one hand, you have engineered systems where somebody is actually responsible. On the other hand, you have ad hoc systems that 
to use a phrase, just happened. Next slide, please. This is the example of an engineered system that had an accident. It's the Uber self-driving car that on the 18th of March 2018 hit a pedestrian pushing a bicycle across the road in Tempa, Arizona. The accident report by the National Transportation Safety Bureau showed that for five seconds, the car basically couldn't decide whether it was looking at a cyclist, a pedestrian or street furniture. In the end, it couldn't make up its mind. And it failed to brake, resulting in the fatal accident. Next slide, please. The car was controlled by a complex system of systems capable of monitoring and analysing the surrounding environment. The principal subsystems included LIDAR on the roof, radar all round, camera systems all over the place, various telemetry, positioning, monitoring and telecom systems. As the NTSC report makes clear, the crash occurred because the central control systems in the car could not make sense of the information coming from this multiplicity of inputs until it was too late, which is very relevant to the way in which a lot of uh, complex systems can fail. Next slide, please. Looking at an example of an ad hoc system, the 2008 financial crash showed that the world's financial system was complex and unstable. Three of the characteristics of a complex system are large numbers of parties involved, many with conflicting objectives, wide geographical uh, organisational spread, and no single regulatory oversight. The financial system ticked all those three boxes and far more besides. In the UK alone, there are more than 50,000 brokers, and in the US, it's estimated about 1.5 million day traders. There are many different sets of national regulations, and the vast change and increase in internet connectivity over the last two decades has enabled trading on a scale never previously envisaged. This was a large, ad hoc, complex system that in the end failed. Next slide, please. Returning to engineered systems, this is a diagram that was produced some years ago in a, an academy publication. The most important area is that shown in the top left of the diagram, which is the, the area enclosed in the oval, which is basically in defining what it is the system has to do, not just in general arm waving terms, but in detail under different operating conditions and partial failure conditions. From there, this becomes a classic V curve, going down the left hand side, specifying what actually has to be done, and going up the right hand side, building, testing and commissioning the various component parts of the system. Rather than talk about general complex systems, I'd like to use an example, one that formed the basis of a case study for the Safer Complex System programme. Next slide, please. This is a train crash at Hatfield, just north of London. UK rail industry was privatised over a period from 1984 to 1997. Over that time, various parts of it were transferred to the private sector. There were three main accidents in the period, Southall in 1997, Ladbroke Grove in 1999 and Hatfield in 2000. The timing may have been coincidental and no one officially linked them to privatisation. On the 17th of October 2000, a London to Leeds train was travelling north when it derailed at Hatfield. The locomotive and the first two coaches stayed on the track. The rest were derailed with four deaths and more than 70 injured. Next slide, please. The investigation found that the problem was rolling contact fatigue that had caused disintegration of one of the rails. I'm not going to the physics of it, but the risk of moving from the elastic regime at the left hand side of the diagram to the flow regime at the right depends on contact stress and horizontal force. The diagram shows various other factors, such as small wheels or high tractive efforts 
that exacerbate the problem. The trains that have been ordered during the privatisation period were specified to have much higher tractive effort per axle than, pre than previously. Also, because of various other specifications, the bogies were stiffer, again, one of the bad factors in this area. Speci uh, sophisticated creep control had to be used, and there were smaller wheels. All these were counterproductive. Next slide, please. You then ask the question, well, how on earth did this situation arise? And if you look at the post privatization railway, there was no railway authority. On the left, you have the various bodies responsible for the infrastructure. On the right, the various bodies responsible for operating and building trains. Next slide, please. As part of the complex systems programme, we asked York University to prepare a model for complex system failures. And this shows this, failure, this, this framework that they described. Basically, there are two time, two places where you can intervene to reduce the risk. One is design time controls when you're designing it and specifying it. The other is operation time controls. It's clear from reading the Hatfield official report that the official inquiry concentrated on the operation time controls, in particular, the performance of the maintenance contractor. In the 250 page document, there's almost no reference to how the railway had arrived at a situation where there was no sort of way of working without creating these hazards. Next slide. Several of the um, case studies undertaken as part of the uh, complex systems project have identified failures of government as being absolutely key to the reason for things failing. Unrealistic timescales, badly defined objectives, asking for technical impossibilities, splitting responsibilities, dysfunctional management, all these things all came out in any number of different case studies. So conclusions. Next slide, please. What do we have to do for building back better? I suggest the first objective is to determine the objectives, including what we're looking for from resilience. Sort out the governance arrangements so that an identifiable and competent body is responsible. Think carefully about system boundaries. Appoint a systems architect to convert the objectives into deliverables and regularly review all the objectives during the build so that we're solving the real problems and not yesterday's problems. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Roger. Um, that was a really great overview of the challenges and um, interesting to hear um, about this work. Our next speaker is Anne-Marie Eklund Lovinder. CEO of AmelSec, an internet pioneer, and one of Sweden's leading experts on information security. So over to you, Anne-Marie. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, we wait for the slides to show up. Yes, there you are. I'm an internet pioneer, as mentioned. Uh, I love ASCII art. Um, I spent more than 30 years in the information IT and cybersecurity area, and my opinion is that we have some work to do, a lot, to be honest. Next slide, please. Resilient engineering are powerful words. If you are resilient, it means that you not only talk to talk, you also walk to walk, and you know what to do to prevent bad things from happening, or at least to minimize the consequences when it happens. And that reminded me of the song by Sir Elton John, I'm still standing. That is resilience to me. Next slide, please. Through digitization, even the critical infrastructures that satisfies our basic needs, such as electrical power, water, railways, and other distribution networks are centrally monitored by modern IT systems. To run and monitor these networks, internet has become more and more indispensable. If these monitoring systems fall victim of cyber attacks, it will lead to serious disturbances. And yet we do not spend much time on making the basic infrastructure more robust, 
resilient and redundant. Next slide, please. Digitization is finding its way into more and more areas. Industry is no exception. Production facilities are constantly connected. Machines can be controlled remotely via the internet and data can be exchanged within a few seconds. We are no longer just talking about information technology, uh, IT. Now we have to think about OT or operational technology or operation of industrial control systems as well. IT uses technology to handle information. In OT, similar technologies use bus for operations and to control and, or, and manage physical things. So uh, this can be machines in a factory, electricity production in a power plant. It can be a chemical process in a refinery. And in IT, the focus is often on protecting secrets or protecting data from being disclosed or manipulated. But in OT, it's often most important to keep a function accessible and correct. This means that the security works looks a little different. Uh, when the digital, with the digital development, we see more and more examples of recurring, frequent and sophisticated cyber attacks. That's the new normal. At the same time, employees in many companies, organizations struggle with a high workload and a limited budget and have neither the time nor the mandate to listen to the good advice that comes from, among others, IT security experts and engineers. I will give you some examples. Next slide, please. A 12-year-old boy tricked his father to pay $40 for a Minecraft thingy. Next slide, please. But he bought himself a botnet and some tubes to take down the County of Gotland website and digital services. Now, this tells us more about the county's resilience than it tells us about the boy and his father. He bragged that it took him about 30 minutes to get through the defense of the county system, and the attack was going on for three weeks and costed the county of Gotland 1.5 million Swedish kronor. That is particularly not resilient. Next slide, please. A week ago, we had a major power outage in Stockholm, which affected most of the public transportation, traffic lights, 30,000 homes, shops, and more. Next slide, please. As you can see, it was quite a chunk that blackened, and the mobile phone system of different operators stopped working after 10 to 30 minutes. And even if you had connection to the base station, neither calls nor data traffic worked. That is not particularly resilient. Next slide, please. The truth is, neither consumers or companies are capable of securing every device in the network, which gives cyber criminals and cyber terrorists a possibility to take hostages with no more than one insecure, unprotected device. They pose not only a big risk to, for companies and governments all over the world, they have the potential to seriously damage the internet itself. Next slide, please. And there is some uncertainty about what to protect against and why. Sometimes the infrastructure for electricity and electronic communication are interrelated, which places additional, additional demands on collaboration with others while engineering resiliently. So how do you interact in your sector and how do you interact with others to which you have dependencies? Next slide, please. And this is a race, racing um, event, nation state cyber attacks who have doubled in three years. That has become more and more uh, obvious. And uh, if you read Ross, Professor Ross Anderson's book, The Security Engineering, Chapter 2, you will get a feeling about what this is. Next slide, please. So the best way to make the internet more secure is to realize you can't and to do your best to secure your own environment. Bad things will happen, no doubt. Just make sure that the consequences is kept to a minimum. Zero trust is a term for an evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms that move defenses from static network-based parameter to focus on users, assets, and resources. The fact that more and more of our data is being stored in the cloud uh, and among devices on the Internet of Things means that increasingly sensitive types of data are now more vulnerable than ever to become hacked and more attractive to hackers as well. Next slide, please. So the definition of operational resilience is the ability of systems to resist, absorb and recover from or adapt to an adverse occurrence during operation that may cause harm, destruction or loss of ability to perform mission-related functions. 
But today, there's so many parts of this complex system that you are not aware of that you even have. So this will become even more difficult. Next slide, please. In our modern society, individuals' decision-making has become increasingly important and problematic because the rising complexity and volatility of the decision-making situations. Individuals today must make important or faithful decisions in an almost reflex-like manner without enough time or knowledge at hand. Such decision-making requires increased trust, for example, in the experts with appropriate knowledge and skills. And time is rarely on our side. Next slide, please. But at the end of the day, turning off the Internet is not an option. In order to overcome the difficulties we experience today, we need, I'm sorry, <clears throat> we need to take security by design and security by default very seriously. So that is what will save us, or at least help us a lot. Uh, it's not too late to make a difference. Next slide, please. So we need to stop. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. We need to stop heading down the rabbit hole uh, in the chase of the next bug, because that is um, what we're doing right now. We're not using digitalization for good anymore. And I believe trust has become one of the most powerful competitive uh, differentiations in today's world. Trust is the defining quality that determines whether you can continue to do business and, uh, and flourishing connections with your companies or your customers. As technology connects more of our lives at an ever, incre ever increasing pace, it's how vendors and service providers build and maintain trust that will govern the success of digital interactions. Creating a strong security culture among users on the internet makes all the difference. Next slide, please. In the end, it's all about addressing risk. If we ignore the risk of being hacked with long interruptions and privacy problems as a result, digitalization is a fantastic idea. But without risk assessment and measures, you put your head, head in the sand, cybersecurity cannot be handled with optimism and prayers. It takes a responsible leadership, risk management, dedicated resources, and last but not least, systematic and structural work. It's time to get those cybersecurity def security defenses ready. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite quotes. It's the Hanlon's Racer. Never attribute to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Anne-Marie. I, I really enjoyed hearing the examples. It really brings this topic to life. Um, so our next uh, speaker, uh, before we move to the panel discussion, is Carsten Ort Gern Larsen, Senior Vice President at the Technical University of Denmark. And prior to this, uh, Mr. Gern Larsen was CEO of CLEAN, Denmark's green cluster, which focuses on energy and environmental technologies. And um, over to you, Carsten. Thank you very much, Desmond. So pleased to be here, everybody. Um, over the past five years, the Academy of Technical Sciences uh, have analyzed the framework conditions uh, for making Denmark one of the world's uh, leading science and engineering uh, regions. Since the COVID pandemic hit us, uh, this work has been increasingly uh, important. The essence of making Denmark one of the world's leading science and engineering regions uh, will at the same time ensure that Denmark uh, as a society and as an economy will prosper, not only for companies, but also for individuals, and through that being resilient. In my short presentation here, um, I will outline the work we have engaged upon over the past five years and highlight some of the key uh, recommendations that we have presented to our stakeholders. Our project uh, was uh, sponsored with uh, 3.4 million pounds and uh, we made 10 um, reports uh, throughout this phase, uh, did some study trip and we analyzed in depth various uh, things about the Danish uh, um, ecosystem and that of uh, some of the regions of the world. So the good question is, do we have a burning platform? Next slide, please. 
one of the key elements of our project was to view Denmark as a region itself, not as a country, but as a region, in order for us to compare with other leading regions of the world, i.e. Uh, southern Germany, uh, the Yangtze River Delta, uh, or of course the Bay Area in San Francisco. Actually, we looked at 30 um, regions of the world uh, in total. And uh, one of our key reports um, was actually comparing, uh, compar uh, comparing 11 areas of technology in which we pride ourselves in Denmark of being in the lead. And we were in for a surprise when we did that analysis. We looked at a proxy for growth uh, or knowledge. We looked at publications and patents over the past 20 years. In our report, we could show that there is a clear shift from the west to the east. Some of you, um, we, uh, most of you will be familiar with that. Moreover, uh, in 2019, we saw that China took out two thirds of the world's patents, uh, whereas in 1999, China was only one out of 20 patents. So a huge shift. And from a Danish perspective, we saw that uh, we lost ground and our production of patents even though being, of course, small, halved in the period. Now, as we looked at the world uh, and some of these regions, we had the opportunity to uh, complete three global uh, study trips to some of the more traditional areas. Next slide, please. We visited the uh, Bay Area the, uh, uh, in, uh, and Boston in the US. We visited uh, the Yangtze Delta and Shanghai in particular, and we came to uh, Bangalore and New Delhi. And uh, we did this, of course, to learn and get inspired and uh, to see what are, uh, are people doing in other of these uh, technology hotspots around the world. And uh, it was very clear, our conclusion was very clear. As a small nation, Denmark and Danish uh, engineering stakeholders, we are in a midst of a huge process that everybody else out there has spotted and would like to get their fair share of the value creation and the knowledge uh, available or to be built in that uh, in order for those local societies to thrive. Now, what did we find? These might not seem interesting to you, but here are seven of the, the highlights. Most of these areas had very strong visions, clear goals and long-term planning of what they were doing. They focus on local ecosystems. They are mission-driven and cross-disciplinary in their collaboration mindset. They, uh, of course, focus on talent. Talent is a the thing. Entrepreneurs are seen as rock stars and embracing risk and the go-do culture is something uh, being characterized by these settings. And of course, there's ICT in everything. But these seven things we had to take notice of in our assessment of how are we doing in Denmark. Next slide, please. One of the things we realized is that we might not, uh, from a science and engineering perspective, have an up-to-date version of how should we look at these things. So we uh, established a series of um, sort of data gathering reports we call them state of the nation reports, where we sort of uh, gathered information about what is our science and engineering system uh, actually? How do we define the companies? Where, what is the growth of these companies? What types of employees do we see in companies that thrive the, uh, the growth and use technology in, in this uh, thing? So uh, in, heart of, in the heart of this, we defined something new uh, science and engineering companies, which we uh, see as uh, business models that build heavily on engineering and uh, STEM competences. And we use this as a means to get a dialogue with the Danish government, the, um, uh, the other stakeholders, and we have grouped and looked into the performance of these uh, uh, companies and compared them to the view that normally drive our development, our society, namely that of industry manufacturing at large. And here we saw some very interesting things. Mind you, Denmark is a small uh, country or a small region. We are 5.8 million people. But nevertheless, we identified uh, 2,400 roughly companies that was characterized as being science and engineering companies. And what we saw here was that these companies are 
productive value creating beyond that of the industry when you look at, look at the average uh, numbers. And it's uh, re uh, re relative to the Danish uh, workforce, some 300,000 people, and it's a quite a uh, large amount of uh, um, uh, GDP that uh, stems from these companies, and the export is actually uh, quite large. Actually, we could see that uh, the S&E companies, uh, in average, um, was 14% uh, more productive than um, than the uh, normal industry uh, figures. Next slide, please. Then we also had another interesting finding, and I'm sorry, there was a, a, a Danish version here uh, where it says Årsværk, it means full-time equivalent uh, to the left on this uh, slide. But what we actually showed here uh, and, and discovered was something that most of us might have known, but actually we, now we got uh, figures for it. And that is if, if, if you look at a science and engineering startup uh, and see it, uh, it uh, evolve over time, you would see that particularly after year uh, uh, three or four, it's three times, uh, they, it has two or three times more um, employees the growth is uh, outperforming that of industry. And if you look at it for a 10 year onwards perspective, the science and engineering companies outperform uh, heavily, even the best at industry. A very interesting figure. And I think something that needs, of course, to be in the core of how we build a resilient ecosystem uh, uh, here in Denmark. Now, if you move to the next one, uh, it's uh, next slide, please. So, so one of the things that we believe uh, from the ATV perspective is that science and engineering is actually the key driver in making Denmark uh, resilient and can sustain growth that can also pay for a much pressed welfare state in terms of funding, certainly, but certainly also because we have much more challenges, much more things we would like to see and get done. But you will also see that once you dive into it, the core of what we do is not only about individuals or individual companies or individual institutions. It is actually what we managed to do together. And as an example, I can just mention, this is a picture from one of our clusters in Denmark. It's a newly started robotics cluster called Odense Robotics. It's actually a fairy tale like the Hans Christian Andersen of Odense, uh, uh, one of the founding fathers of Danish uh, ch ch children literature. Um, they started out basically from nothing, had some very ambitious people involved and managed to build a fantastic cluster around persons, individuals that managed to work together and, it, and actually over time has been one of the most uh, strengthful clusters of uh, Denmark. So it can be done. Um, we are trying to dive into what are the ingredients that make it happen. And for my final slide, uh, just to give you an overall perspective, last slide please. You can see here from the work we have done, seven overall out of 30 recommendations which we which we carried and i would just like to highlight a certainly one that uh, came to mind when we did this um, that is the lack of political leadership this is a requirement that we need to have and we certainly need to have some sort of leadership that will uh, make this happen in our setting so i thank you very much for your attention and look forward to the discussion onwards thank you Thank you so much for that, Carsten. And thank you to all our speakers. Uh, I think we will pick up um, a lot of the issues that you've talked about in the panel discussion. Uh, we are going to take a quick 10 minute comfort break uh, before we reconvene with our speakers and the additional panel members for a discussion. Uh, we'll be putting your questions to uh, them as well, so please do put them into the Q&A that's below the live stream. Uh, please be ready to join us again at 2.30pm uh, GMT, uh, that's 3.30pm uh, CET. So I will see you shortly.